Brilliant. Thank you so much to all three of our speakers. Um, I think we're going to get the Slido back up on the screen now. Um, you still have time to vote and ask questions if you would like to. Um, but while we just wait for that, I will start reading out the first one, um, which is for you, Meevan. Um, this questioner asks, I like your hierarchy of needs for the misinformation ecosystem. How do we grow the mesh, which is the NGOs, influencers, and fact checkers? How do we grow that layer? I think it's very country specific. Um, I think it's really important to grow it. Um, it's come up a few times in other conversations today, but this role of like institutions versus, well, how inst trust in institutions is essentially changing. And actually some of that trust is going towards community groups, influences, like individual voices. Um, and so I agree with you that the mesh layer needs to grow. Um, and needs to work with those institutions and the people who make that more authoritative information. But who the mesh layer are is very highly specific to each country's context. Um, and I think it, in some places, depending on like certain political freedoms or cultural norms, um, you'll see certain types of influences being more influential. Um, and some, in some cases, you know, fact checkers are considered very political, and in some cases, fact checkers are considered uh, more neutral. And so, um, I think it, there's no easy answer for that one. It's very like specific, um, and hopefully, the the nuances of that will be captured in the organisations taking part and making the decision for who the membership body would be. Um, but I think the most important thing is coming into it with a wide view about who is in the community and being able, bold enough really, to explore adding more people into the mesh layer. So the Philippines really did a great example of that by bringing in people um, like lawyers or specific researchers to work on it from the beginning. Um, and that was a step in the right direction. Thank you. Well, Slido's really nicely lined me up one question for each of the panelists as we go through. Um, so, Rhoda, how do you pre um, prevent open tools like Ushahidi being used by bad actors, directing them to areas where they can harm vulnerable people? So, preventing bad faith actors. All right. Thanks for that question. Um, so, we have two sets of uses for the Ushahidi platform, one being uh, open source, whereby we all open source, but we host them. So we are constantly conducting checks on the types of deployments uh, or initiatives that are churned out using the platform and um, to ensure that you know, there aren't any that are being used to, for harm, as, as, as you said there. Um, I think the black box that we would have is probably on the ones that are uh, self-hosted, whereby the organization takes the tool for themselves and hosts it on their own um, servers. So that's close to us, even us, we would not have access to that. But the majority of the initiatives are, we host them. So regularly checking the new, um, because every month we have to do uh, sort of uh, checks to see how many deployments were, were, um, have, have been are new or and what sort of thematic area are they focusing on. So in this way, then we're able to see which ones are, are um, for good and thankfully, or, yeah, thankfully so far we haven't come across any that is, has been used for bad, but thank you for that question. Thank you so much. And then the next question is for you, Matt. Um, did you come across any civic tech needs that surprised you? Sure. Um, thanks for the question and the votes on the question. <laughs> um, the one that surprised me most, because I didn't know about it, was how many groups were using this matrix protocol. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but I, it was cool to learn about that. This is the open way to use SMS and other messaging services for your organization. Um, and then the other one that surprised me was the extent to which organizations around the world were really desperate for contacts at the major tech platforms. And I knew that was a need, and I've worked at a major tech company, and I know, like, in the field guide, we track civic teams at these companies. Um, but the extent to which people in very different areas of election administration or um, you know, getting more women elected to office, like different fields all had similar challenges of just finding someone to talk to at these companies. Whether or not programs exist at the companies um, definitely popped out. Brilliant, thanks so much. I wonder if we've got any questions in the room that anybody would like to ask? Or if we can put it on Slido. Yeah, Rose. 
sorry, I'll just somebody is just coming to you with the mic. Um, thanks all for your contributions. And um, this is a question for Rhoda. Um, I wondered if you had experienced any hostility um, from governments where you've set up the election monitoring tool and how you dealt with that. Um, I would say what we do especially, let me use Kenya because that's where we have mostly um, conducted the monitoring processes. Um, we have had, in the example of internet shutdowns, um, we have had trainings by Tor to help us navigate the system. Um, however, we also include the government in, in the process. Uh, like I'd mentioned, one of the partners was the communications authority because they also, we, need to, we needed to channel um, reports of misinformation to them. Um, have we encountered any hostile government? In the Kenyan instances, not yet. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I think our next highest voted question on Slido is for you, Mevan. Why did you join Google? Can you explain why you believe this is the right way to have impact? It's a very brave question for someone to ask. <laughs> uh, uh, anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super happy to answer it. Um, I'm like, I came from nonprofit world. Uh, I've kind of exclusively worked in nonprofit world until a year and a half ago. Um, and um, I didn't expect to be working at Google, I'll be honest. Um, but working at the front lines of misinformation in the UK, and also I was on the board of the International Fact Checking Network, which looked at 300 fact checking organizations around the world, um, I realized that a really big part of my understanding of the misinformation landscape was missing. And that was what was happening inside the tech platforms. Um, and so part of joining Google for me was filling in my own understanding of the problem, understanding the motivations of the tech platforms, um, understanding it much more deeply so that the impact that I could have would be like not missing a huge third of the problem. I understand it from the point of view of governments, I understand it from the point of view of civil societies, but I didn't understand it from tech platforms. So that was like part of it for me. Um, and also the other part of it is, inevitably, it is a place that has a lot of sway and it has a lot of power and it has 135,000 people that think about problems deeply and the subsection of those people that think about misinformation are doing it in a very particular way. And I think it's important, I'm a deeply pragmatic person, I think it's important that people with different values and different perspectives are part of those conversations. Um, my own background is I was a refugee for five years and, uh, and Kurdish from Iraq. And so I've personally had experiences of how misinformation and propaganda has led to genocides. Um, and actually that perspective is something that I bring to the conversations that I have at Google um, and don't get me wrong, it's not necessarily like an easy position to hold, but I do think it's important that um, there are different voices in those conversations. And I know that a lot of the people in this room who started out in the civic tech space have also ended up at places like the NHS or in governments or to actually kind of uh, change how institutions think and behave. And so part of me being at Google is um, trying to hold that space. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, brilliant. I think maybe I'll go to the next question for Matt and then we'll go back to a question for Rhoda. Um, Matt, how do you encourage partnership and networking between NGOs and CSOs who are already underfunded and overstretched? Aside, of course, from my society's communities of practice. Yes. Um, thanks for the question. I'll address the subtext of the question first, <laughs> which is that. Um, it can be difficult to find the time and resources and energy and everything to, to do that peer collaboration. Um, funders can specifically fund like those mechanisms, whether it's a conference scholarship or part of a larger grant can be specifically around like having time to document what you did and send it to people. So that's a very specific thing. Um, and then in terms of like how it happens, my one of my favorite examples is um, actually an election, I'm not sure if it's election, but 
Code for Africa's uh, fact check coalition in Africa is just a great team up of complementary skills. So many of us in civic tech are good at doing things like building tools or helping semi-automate fact checking. What we don't do well traditionally is market or build a big audience. <laughs> like how many civic tech apps have died in the app store with like under 100 installs, right? So in that case, with the Code for Africa network, uh, they partnered with hundreds of newsrooms, I think, hundreds, right, across the continent that had already built their own audiences locally with local context and large audiences. And then Code for Africa and partners can come in on the tech side. And that to me is like a perfect complement uh, example where you just do what you're good at and don't have to do what you're bad at. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much. Um, I wondered if there was another question in the room or we'll go back to Slido. Oh, yep, yeah, one question over there. Thank you. Um, <coughs> when you're looking at things like, sorry, I, I, Matrix, every time I've seen organizations do things like that, it's a tool that people in open source love, but it doesn't benefit from the huge amounts of UX that big tech put mm -hmm. into stuff. When you're looking at these tools, how do you strike that balance between going where people already are and organizing with tools that are flawed on so many levels, politically and all the rest of it, versus a utopian, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but like a utopian, we can do better with the tools that we use. And I, I'm wondering as well with the sort of, um, for both you and Rhoda with that question, because I think maybe the context of building things from scratch, yeah, I think it might work in both things. Go first. I love that question, and for me it varies. It mainly comes down to, is it an election year? So my work on political campaigns, it's like, no, we just have to win and like prevent the apocalypse right now. And in that case, I'm straight to WhatsApp. I'm super practical, like where people are, where you can have the most impact. There's you know, folks in the UK that are connecting WhatsApp to CRMs and, and building kind of third party infrastructure on top of the thing that everyone's already using, right? It's the di distribution solved, everyone has it in certain places or apps like WhatsApp. Then on a non-election year, we can invest in that utopian vision of build the open source thing, build the thing where we actually own the contact data, you know? Um, but that's kind of how I think of it. It's just super practical, go where people are when you need to, and then long term, we need to invest in, in the alternatives being more appealing, right? Yeah. Oh, and just one other thing, that's another reason to work at Google or Microsoft or Facebook. <laughs> I seriously believe this. I was at DC nonprofits for many years. It was like ideologically very pure, and we had 20,000 people on an email list, and I sent the email, so I just knew we could get a 5% click-through on any action we took. And it was just a very firm ceiling on how much impact I could have at that job, even though it was very pure. And then I saw tech platforms where you have billions of users of different products, and I'm a huge fan of things like Facebook's invested to help register voters. Facebook's voter registration thing that they put in the newsfeed in the US registered more voters in 2016 than my work full-time on the Hillary campaign where we built tons of different voter registration apps to make it easy, had like an army of celebrities helping us, and Facebook just plopping it there in partnership with civic tech nonprofits to do the data side, uh, just so much more impact. So I think there's also that, like I'm not afraid of going to the mainstream apps if we can embed, and I have a little Tumblr called Civic Features of like where we can embed these features into mainstream apps, because I think it's a, a nice cross section. Really interesting, thanks so much. Um, okay, I think we'll go back to Slido. Um, maybe we'll, I mean, we might even finish five minutes early because our speakers finished five minutes early so we can be first in the queue for the drinks. Um, but the next question is, Rhoda, what Ushahidi use case are you most proud of and why? Um, <coughs> this isn't an election monitoring one. It's, uh, hum so we work in four key thematic areas. Uh, good governance, human rights protection, climate action and humanitarian and disaster relief. I would say the most I'm most proud of is called Harass Map, which is an initiative that was um, initiated in Egypt uh, for women, providing a safe online space for women to anonymously report on um, sexual rights violations. Uh, that being a taboo there to speak about, so women felt that they didn't have anywhere safe, but because this was an online and it was anonymous, then 
it enabled the Egyptian women in a space to report on on how they felt that they were being, you know, what they understood basically about sexual rights violation or about sexual violation. And this resulted in uh, small things such as even putting street lights somewhere so that the f women felt safe to walk and they did not feel like they're going to get cut cold or, or violated any other way. To all this data that was collected, that which was then taken now to the national level, to policy level change, um, in ways that then now protected the Egyptian women. And this model was then translated, I think, to nine other countries in the region, um, just so that women could feel that this wasn't a taboo topic to talk about. They felt more open to talk about it. So I love this initiative, one, because I am a woman, and two, because it broke a barrier, a social barrier that existed. So the tool enabled that barrier to be broken, and, and I love it for that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and then I think our next one, we could actually apply to the whole panel, so maybe that'll be a nice way to close. Um, what makes you hopeful looking forward? Uh, can I start with you, Miva, and we'll go down that way? <laughs> Mics from all angles. Um, maybe we should have started at the other end. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, there's a lot. There's a lot that makes me hopeful. Um, I think there. I think I have to remember that there's a lot of really great work happening. This is going to be a pet talk for myself, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, there's obviously a lot of scary things happening in the world right now with elections, but also um, I like to keep it very real um, by remembering that for all of the you know deep fakes being made and for all of the like election manipulation happening, there are also people on the ground who are trying to serve voters every single day with polling station data or candidate data like Democracy Club in the UK or like people who built the Hayas map or the work, work that Yir Shahidi do. Um, and I think that is, gives me a lot of hope. It gives me actually a lot of joy it does also scare me a little bit um, because I, I also know just how much of these services are run off the backs of these brilliant human beings. Um, and I do think more long term, we need to see more resources in the space. We need to see more transformational amounts of resources in the space, like not just people bundling together and kind of making the most of what we have, but kind of demanding more sometimes. Um, and I'm hopeful that um, more people in the tech platforms and the funding space are, are slowly realizing that. Um, and I hope that in the next you know, decade that there will be transformational levels of resources in this space. I am hopeful because on the flip side, if we, you saw the map about you know, the openness to closeness, I feel like if we stay still, if we don't do anything, then we are all just moving towards the closedness. So it's more of, we cannot afford, st I, I stay hopeful because we cannot afford to stay still. Because the more we stay still, the more bad people, bad harms keep escalating. So we've got to, we've got to continue to fight back. The alternative isn't a good one, honestly. Nice hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> dark hope. It's like the, the new Star Wars. Um, I think, so I've got a civic tech hope and then a broader hope. The broader hope is that, um, you know, I went into politics and government into Washington, D.C. because I was like, oh, if you change the law of the country, you can make everything better. Obviously, we start there. And then I got there and realized that politicians and legislatures are on the trailing edge, end of change and that culture comes first. And my favorite example is gay marriage in the US where Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, all the Democrats were not supporting gay marriage. And then Will and Grace and TV shows and you know, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, all these shows made it popular and acceptable in the culture. And then suddenly Democrats came along and now we have legalized gay marriage. So. And the, these are precarious things, but even if we lose and laws get changed, the culture is changed forever in, these, in, in some of these topics. So we haven't talked about it today, but the extent to which we can do storytelling and narrative change work, uh, I think that can really behoove it. So 
my civic tech hope is just that we all get better at doing this work. We learn from each other. I, I learn from the projects I see every single day, things I didn't know existed, new hacks and ways of improving things. But um, yeah, just that we get better at what we do. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think there is a lot to be hopeful there. Um, I think I'll end us there. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us.